real scarers look like us. <laughs> <laughs> From murderous cars to magic witches and fraternity monsters, we've still got lots of Pixar villains who need to answer for their crimes. So, once again, we're bringing them into our courtroom and delivering some justice upon them. I'm Keefe Nosy with Wicked Binge, and today we're sentencing Pixar villains for their crimes. Up on today's docket are the villains from the following movies, Cars 2, Brave, Monsters University, and Inside Out. The first movie we'll be discussing is everyone's absolute favorite Pixar film, no exceptions, Cars 2. Starting off our Cars 2 docket is Sir Miles Axelrod. Miles Axelrod is the main antagonist of Cars 2, where he leads a society of lemons or old unused cars that have become damaged over time. Axelrod uses his connections to run this group in such a way that he acts as a stereotypical Bond villain. He spends most of the film working on a massive conspiracy to completely disable green energy and other non-oil fuels. This is an abuse of power and would undoubtedly be considered corruption in some shape or form. Due to what exactly he was trying to do, he pretty heavily leaned into increasing pollution, destroying property, and even the attempted murder of some of the protagonists. However, while these are heinous crimes, it's worth noting that those aren't the worst he's been up to, as he commits a massive amount of crimes against men, or, or car kind, which include what we would typically label as crimes against humanity, and even attempts a massive amount of mass murder. Due to hiding behind the scenes so effectively, it's hard to really say if he'd be prosecuted, but with everything we know about him, it's pretty clear that Miles Axelrod should be handled accordingly, Axelrod would be executed via dismantling or scrapping. Axelrod's accomplice and friend, Professor Zundap, is next to be sentenced. Zundap makes his first appearance a strong one because he pops up and orders the murder of a British spy and then attempts to murder his partner, Finn McMissile. He's trying to sabotage the World Grand Prix, intending on sabotage and destruction of property to stop anyone that comes across his path. This includes another execution-style murder when he has his crew crush Rod Torque Redline because he was Finn McMissile's contact in Tokyo. He stalks and hunts down Mater once he has the classified info and attempts to murder him on more than one occasion. You will find the second agent. Him. He's caused mass death by igniting the alternative fuel some cars are using and is sabotaging this alternative fuel because of their high supply of oil, making them even more powerful. Zundap is an enforcer for Axelrod and is aiding and abetting his evil plans, mostly because he hates being made fun of due to his lemon status. Zundap would face a similar fate to his boss and his victims, being executed by a car crusher. Rounding out our Cars 2 docket is Francesco Bernoulli. Francesco is an Italian race car and a rival to Lightning McQueen during the World Grand Prix. As a young boy car, he would race alongside his friends by trespassing on a popular racing strip. He pops up throughout the film racing against Lightning and forming a pretty hefty rivalry with him. While the two of them race, Francesco doesn't do much in terms of crime beyond being a bit of a douche. In fact, Francesco's only crime, beyond being very clearly cocky, is some petty stuff from the past. Honestly, at worst, he'd get a $500 fine for his petty trespassing. Moving forward, we have a classic film with some interesting villains we need to dissect. None other than Brave. The first criminal we'll be talking about is Mordu. Mordu is a decades-old prince who used magic to turn himself into a bear. When his father decided that the four princes should rule together, Mordu was against this, severing his bond with them and declaring that he alone should be king. This led to a war between him and his brothers, leading to massive casualties and a ton of destruction, but as this was through war and no war crimes were committed, he can't really be prosecuted for that. After obtaining a spell from the witch, he turned into a large black bear and quickly murdered all three of his brothers, which would be three counts of fratricide. The final crime he committed while conscious is the mass murder of many of his previous soldiers. Mordu later lost all traces of his mind, and any crimes committed past that point are pretty much irrelevant, at least for the purposes of this trial. So from what Mordu has done, it makes perfect sense for him to be executed via beheading, as not only is this accurate for the time, but seems to be the only way to put the bear down. The other criminal we'll be discussing from Brave is the Witch. The Witch, otherwise known as the Witch Carver, is a powerful witch that lives within the forest and grants mostly bear-based wishes to those who come across her. She ends up casting the spell that turns Mordu into the dangerous bear we know now, and would be somewhat responsible for the deaths that Mordu caused. So, at best, this would be accessory to murder, and at worst, would be aiding and abetting. She's also responsible for the spell that turns the queen into a bear, this, of course, a potential crime of poisoning, or maybe even something more sinister, but as Merida is the one who does it, it's hard to really put the witch at full fault. The witch carver's punishment is 10 years in prison without the chance of parole. To be honest, though, she should just be happy we aren't burning her at the stake. We're just nice like that. Moving from new films back to sequels and prequels, up next, we have Monsters University. The first villain we'll be dissecting from this film would be Dean Hardscrabble. Dean Abigail Hardscrabble is the dean of the scare program at the university that Mike and Sully are attending. Upon her first arrival, she makes a great entrance, knocking out all the lights in the room, which allows her to scare all the people in the room, inciting mass terror to further her agenda of inciting further terror. Your luck will run out, eventually. 
Now, while this is not violent, it would technically, under most definitions, be considered terrorism. By the end of the film, after a variety of games called the Scare Games, Mike Wazowski ends up passing into the human world through a door, which Hardscrabble then has destroyed, which would probably be called unlawful imprisonment. Now, beyond that, she doesn't do much we can prosecute on, which is a shame considering she's the closest to an actual villain the film has. After everything she did throughout the film, we sentence her to five years in prison with the chance of parole. Ranking next on our list is Johnny Worthington III, the leader of of the frat Roar Omega Roar and a major antagonist in the film. Johnny leads his frat much like Bradley Uppercrust III in an extremely goofy movie. He acts as a snobby rich boy who cares far too much for his reputation and how his frat is seen, and this comes over to his crimes, as few as they may be. Johnny's most consistent crimes are extortion and threats, although both of these are aimed at Sully specifically to be kicked out of the frat, so they're not exactly massive crimes by any stretch of the imagination. However, he is shown to consistently harass Mike and the rest of the Uzma Kappas, including assaulting them by pouring glitter and paint on them. Release the stuffed animals. In fact, he not only photographs the group without their consent, but then sells the images as well. In fact, that would be easy grounds for a lawsuit, as he does it specifically to make people less scared of them, which is entirely purposeful because in the monster world, and the scare games specifically, that image is vastly important. Now, none of these crimes are particularly violent, however, this is clear-cut harassment. Worthington is a man who cares far too much about his own personal image to ever consider the feelings of others, or even the legality of his own actions. With all that in mind, we sentence Worthington to one year in prison, community service, and a $25,000 fine to be paid to Mike and Uzma Kappa. Rounding out the MU baddies is Chet Alexander. Chet the Claw Alexander is a red crab-like monster who's part of the Roar Omega Roar fraternity at Monsters University. Now, Chet is little more than a yes man who follows orders of Johnny to a T, even when it comes to the harassment and hate crimes we mentioned with his boss. This party is for scare students only. At best, he's an accessory, but considering how active he makes himself in these criminal activities, he's aiding and abetting Johnny's multiple criminal actions. This would be for every one of his crimes, from harassment and assault to the lower bar stuff like threats. Due to the consistent aiding and abetting throughout the movie, we sentence Chet to one year in prison with a chance of parole, as well as community service. The final movie on our docket for today is a newer classic with an upcoming sequel, Inside Out. The one and only villain for this film is not the usual kind of villain, being Gloom. Gloom is an entity that exists within the mind of Riley Anderson, like the other emotions she lives with. Unlike in the original version, where he was a real emotion, Gloom appears as a black mist that overtakes Riley's mind during the film. Now, technically, because of the lack of a full entity, it's hard to prosecute. However, they do have a full list of crimes to discuss. Gloom causes Riley to turn away from her friends and family and isolate herself, but none of these are really criminal actions, only affecting the girl's mind state. However, while it was anger that incited it, Gloom caused the theft and subsequent credit card fraud that Riley does during the film. This is exemplified by the control panel turning gray and the emotions losing control, which obviously means that this feeling of gloom is the one who's responsible. This gloom also causes Riley to start feeling no emotion at all, which causes her not to feel bad for what she's done until it's far too late. Gloom is eventually defeated, but in the short time it appears, Gloom makes quite a name for itself. It could also be argued that Gloom also takes part in identity theft, as Riley does use her mother's name to use the card, and when Gloom is in control, Riley's nothing like herself. However, the reality is Gloom, like all the emotions, is just part of being human. For that reason, we can't really charge Gloom for its crimes, so I guess it's free to go? Hopefully Riley just does her best to keep it in check. 